We open the history, or rather the prehistory of art, with a very elderly woman. Uh, this lady is about 30,000 years old, which makes her one of the very oldest works of art that we possess. Let's hear a little bit about her history from our first video clip, which is from the BBC series How Art Made the World. I find it fascinating that cultures so far apart geographically and presumably without any contact with each other uh, still managed to create such similar and really rather bizarre sculptures. Note, by the way, these terms subtractive and additive, which you need to know, and you've already encountered them in your reading. Basically, additive sculptures are built up from a material, so statues made of clay or cast bronze or welded steel are examples of additive sculpture. Uh, and in fact, the Venus of Doina Vest Vestonici, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, uh, is the oldest ceramic piece ever found. Subtractive sculptures are made by whittling down a material, stone or wood. But this is terminology, and I'd rather return to the interesting question that our video narrator posed, what makes a work art? To begin answering this question, let's fast forward about 10,000 years to a series of caves in southwestern France. In 1940, a French teenager, Marcel Ravida, was out walking in the woods with his dog, Robot. You see them pictured here. Uh, when they came to a sunken spot on the ground, the dog started sniffing and pawing through the leaves. Marcel went to investigate, and he found a vertical shaft. Four days later, he returned with an oil lamp and three friends to investigate. Uh, this virtual tour will give you some idea of what the boys must have seen that afternoon. Well, okay, you're going to learn soon enough that I sometimes get frustrated with the College Board. So, here's the opening statement of the College Board's introductory paper on prehistoric global art. Uh, you should know, by the way, that prehistoric art probably will not appear on this year's test. The exam is being restructured for next year, starting next year. Uh, and this comment appears in the plan for next year's test and beyond. But let's look at the statement anyway. Uh, globally, the earliest people were small groups of hunter-gatherers, clearly true. This is the part that I wondered about, whose paramount concern was sheer survival, resulting in the creation of practical objects. Now it goes on to say these practical tools were accompanied by objects of unknown purpose with uh, various uh, possible uses. Uh, but I really would take some issue with the statement. Yes, these Paleolithic people used only simple stone tools. They hunted or gathered their food rather than growing it. They lived in small family or clan groups, not highly organized communities, and certainly it was a hard life. But do these extraordinary paintings really support the idea that survival was these people's highest value? How would Paul Johnson who wrote the reading you did for today, respond to this statement. I know he got me thinking about how much these paintings cost a society with very limited resources. Some of the bulls at Lascaux are over 20 feet long. Uh, making these would have used up a lot of time, effort, and scarce raw materials. To paint on cave ceilings, artists would have had to erect scaffolding. We still see uh, the remains of the notches where the scaffolding went in these caves. To paint in dark caves, artists needed to use torches soaked in animal fat, and they needed even more animal fat to mix with the pigments so that the paint stuck to the wall. So, why would using large quantities of animal fat be such a big deal? Uh, Paul Johnson makes the point about the fat, but he doesn't really follow through and explain it. So, any theories about why this is significant? Well, fat provided serious calories, and for those people, calories meant continued life. In other words, these paintings were important enough to Paleolithic people that they were willing to crawl into tight and scary dark places, to lie, kneel, or stand for hours on wooden platforms, and to give up a resource that might mean the difference between starvation and survival. And that's why I find myself uh, a little troubled by the College Board statement. Even in the Stone Age, art was about more than practicality, and life was about more than survival. Here are some of the most famous images from the caves of Lascaux. Bulls, or more precisely, Oryx, an early bison-like ancestor of the bull. So what do you think? Are these good paintings? 
and why or why not? Actually, I think, and I think most art critics think, they're remarkably good. They pack a punch even after 16,000 years. So take a look, for example, at the legs. What do you notice? The bulls appear to be moving, which is hard to capture in a painting, as you'd know if you've ever tried. And why are the legs crossed? Well, here again, crossed legs might not seem like a big deal, but in fact, this painting marks a huge artistic and intellectual breakthrough. The problem with painting, we talked about this in class, is that you need to try to convey three-dimensional reality on a two-dimensional surface. The way the artist has positioned the animal's hindquarters makes one bison seem closer to the viewer. What's more, the bull on the right is painted on a section of the cave that juts out, giving the impression it's coming towards you. Artists would not achieve this kind of perspective again until the 15th century CE, and we wouldn't have 3D glasses until the 20th century. So what does this tell us about our prehistoric artists? Yes, they only had stone tools, Yes, they live simple and, and crude and difficult lives, but they were very far from stupid. This brings me back to the question that your textbook poses at the beginning of chapter one and that the video narrator echoed. What makes these cave paintings or any of the other works we're going to study in this course art? Uh, one of your questions on your AP exam in May is going to be a quotation that you'll need to discuss, and you'll need to back up your discussion by analyzing at least one work of art. Well, we might as well start now. Alberti was a famous artist, architect, and art critic during the Renaissance. We will encounter him again. For now, let's think about his quotation. What does the first underlined part of this statement mean? I believe the arts of those who attempted to create images and likenesses originated in the following way. They probably observed in a tree trunk or cloud of earth or other similar inanimate objects certain outlines in which, with slight alterations, something very similar to nature was represented. That's pretty wordy. In your own words, what's he saying? Well, basically, he's saying that art began by imitating nature and was inspired by nature. So here we have a petroglyph from North Africa. It's not an image that appears in your book, but I think it's an interesting uh, work of Paleolithic art. I also don't want you to get the impression that all Paleolithic art was created in Europe. The earliest examples, in fact, come from Africa. And rock art appears all over the world, including in our own backyard. More on that later, but let's return to the Alberti quote. It's easy to imagine that this work began with nature in two different ways. One is obvious. The artist would have seen antelope. Uh, we know from excavated Paleolithic garbage heaps, which archaeologists actually call middens, uh, antelope was the most important meat in the diet of North African Paleolithic peoples. But isn't there another way that the artist could have imitated nature? How might the rock itself have helped direct the artist? Look at the deep line of the antelope's back and how it extends past the animal. It seems pretty clear that this petroglyph began as a crack in the rock. Maybe that crack suggested an antelope to the artist. The artist may also have taken advantage of some existing holes in the rock to make the eyes. So. Uh, perhaps he began by noticing that some natural features in a rock that reminded him or her of an antelope, but the artist did not stop there. Let's turn to the second part of the Alberti quote. They began to take away or otherwise supply whatever seemed lacking to affect and complete the true likeness. This is what I think is the really interesting part of the quote. What about this phrase, true likeness? What does it mean that a piece of art provides a true likeness? Well, one possible definition of a true likeness is a work of art that captures what the eye actually sees. Art historians rather helpfully call this optical art. Uh, what you see here is a Dutch still life from the Baroque era. Again, we're fast forwarding a bit. Uh, this may have been the high point of meticulously realistic optical renderings, at least until the invention of photography. Look at the way the artist is able to capture transparent glass. Wow. 
But how does this early 20th century painter try to capture the true likeness of a war machine, an armored train filled with soldiers firing rifles? The artist clearly did not paint an armored train the way it would show up in a photograph. Instead, he tried to paint the subject in a way that somehow captured the war machine's essence, rather like making a movie by flicking a... Um, so how did he do this? Oops, I got ahead of myself, sorry. Well, mostly he tried to convey movement by showing multiple images, rather like making a movie by flicking a stack of pictures. We'll see that's very characteristic of this group of painters who are called the futurists. We'll get there. Why are the highly stylized soldiers almost identical? What point might the artist be making? Well, maybe he's saying that when they put on their uniform, soldiers become part of the machine, like a machine. They become dangerous, they become anonymous, they become interchangeable. So, in its way, this painting is a kind of true likeness. It isn't optical, but it is descriptive and conceptual because it communicates essential information about the armored train. Sorry about the confusing terminology, by the way. Art historians use the term descriptive when an artist adjusts the optical view in a way that conveys more information about the subject, about how it actually looks. Uh, they use the term conceptual when the artist tries to communicate something beyond physical appearance. Either way, this approach uses art to convey a different kind of true likeness than just what we see with our eyes. So, let's apply this optical dis descriptive conceptual distinction to our Paleolithic work. Well, on the one hand, this is clearly an antelope. We recognize the pointed horns, the long slender legs. Our eyes see these features, right? On the other hand, it is hard to capture every element of an antelope's body with any two-dimensional image. We just can't see an animal from every side at the same time. So this artist has cheated a little by painting the animal in what is called twisted perspective, that is, with the body in profile seen from the side, but the head twisted into a frontal position so we can see both ears, eyes, horns. Would you see an antelope in nature twisted into this position? Eh, probably not. Do we learn more about antelopes because the artist chose his perspective? Yes. So the artist is sacrificing some optical accuracy for descriptive accuracy. Do you see any evidence of a more conceptual or symbolic art? Well, there are those mysterious lines. What might they be? Any theories? We don't know any more than we really know why Paleolithic artists painted 20-foot bulls on the ceilings of caves where they would only be seen by torchlight. Maybe those lines were meant to indicate intestines or some other internal organs that the viewer wouldn't see, but which a hunter would know were there and, for that matter, might be mighty good eating for a Paleolithic family. Maybe the lines represent the animal's spirit. Maybe they're wounds that the hunter inflicted. Maybe they're wounds the hunter hopes to inflict. Uh, maybe the petroglyph was intended to give the hunter magical powers. Again, we don't know. But clearly, the artist is trying to convey information about the subject that goes beyond what we merely see. Now, sometimes artists seek out a quick and obvious way to convey meaning. I'm guessing many of you text. And to speed up the process and still communicate information, you use various kinds of shorthand, like LOL, right? Well, artists use symbols to quickly convey descriptive or conceptual information about their subjects. It's, again, a kind of shorthand. We're going to study this Egyptian relief sculpture in detail very soon. But for now, let me just note that the bulls on top symbolize the pharaoh's manly strength, while the intertwined giraffe heads probably symbolize the joining of Egypt's upper and lower kingdoms. People who were looking at this work of art at the time would get that message very quickly. We call these symbols iconography. Christian art, which will occupy a lot of this course, is filled with iconography. Remember the attributes of the four gospel writers that you encountered in the introduction? Uh, here are two renderings of Luke, who is often represented as a winged ox. Did the bulls or oryx that race across Paleolithic caves similarly symbolize power or manliness? 
We don't know, but we will soon see the bulls carry this meaning in other artistic cultures. Maybe the antelope had symbolic significance to the North African artists beyond uh, a desire for dinner. Again, there are these are cultures that left no written history, so we can only speculate. But these two works also illustrate still more decisions that even the earliest artists had to make. Where do these objects exist in space and time? Where does the viewer stand? Take a look at the antelope. Given the way the antelope is rendered, where would the viewer have to stand to see it this way? And we would only see this view by looking down from above, what we call an aerial perspective. And what about the bull? Where is it standing? Where are we? Ah, and here's a related question. Why, what doesn't appear in any of these Paleolithic paintings or rock sculptures? Sorry, that's a lot of questions. This illustration may give you a better idea of what the painted bull is missing. It's missing a ground line, a place to stand, and it's missing a horizon line that shows where we stand. Uh, these telephone poles are the same height and they're located in the same place on the page. Yet we get a very different impression when the ground and horizon lines change or when they disappear. We've already established that Paleolithic cave painters were talented artists. Is it possible that they left out horizon lines and ground lines deliberately? that the bulls were meant to be seen as somehow outside of time and, and place? We don't know. So here's another puzzling compositional decision. These animals are placed, it seems almost randomly, they face in different directions. There's no identifying vegetation or landscape to tell us where they are. What's more, these animals would not hang out together in nature. So does that mean the artist placed them haphazardly? Does it mean, and this is very plausible, that they were painted at different times by different people and don't really belong together? Optically, notice that some of them are formed with contours and some are silhouettes filled in. Or did the artist want to convey some deeper meaning by bringing these animals together? And by the way, could convey that meaning even by adding new animals on top of those that already existed. That's still a compositional decision. And again, all together now, we don't know. And speaking of not knowing, this is one of the most famous and puzzling paintings in the Lascaux Caves. There are hundreds of scholarly articles that try to figure out this painting. Uh, it's the only painting in the caves, in the Lascaux Caves, that is, that features a human being, uh, except that this human being seems to have the head of a bird. So, do you have any theories about what's going on here? The experts have a lot of theories. The bison seems to be spilling out his guts, maybe after being pierced by that spear. Does that mean the artist was portraying a hunt or maybe representing a desire for a successful hunt? Maybe the painting was intended to convey masculine potency. I am sure you have not missed the fellow's most prominent body part. The bird on a stick resembles shaman rattles that other Stone Age tribes still make. Was Birdman a witch doctor? Maybe he'd gone into a trance to bring on a successful hunt. There are some dots in the bull. This is a little harder to see. Uh, and combined with the eyes, some archaeologists, uh, archaeological astronomers, in fact, think that they may have represented a constellation. Well, so there's meaning here, clearly. But without a historical record, that meaning eludes us. We can, again, only guess. So, anybody recognize this prehistoric art? This is a petroglyph panel from Nine Mile Canyon near Price, just about three hours from Salt Lake City and well worth the trip. I especially recommend taking your bike and, and riding along the road and looking at the petroglyphs, which is how I've done it. Note the dates. We'll be looking at Gothic cathedrals and Mayan temples from these years, but since these people did not leave a written record, uh, we're also left to guess the meaning of these figures, and really they are, for that reason, prehistoric. Okay, I'm going to move fast now, but I want to make a few more points about prehistoric art. I find these clay sculptures of Oryx really spectacular, but note that this is a three versus two dimensional work. 
Also note, though, that it is not sculpture in the round like the Venuses. The technical term for this is relief sculpture, and in fact, this would probably be considered high relief, which means it stands out fairly dramatically from the wall. We're going to see a lot of relief sculpture in the next few weeks. Uh, I'm pretty much skipping over Neolithic art. You read about some of it in your textbook, and we're going to be moving into the art of more settled communities in the next chapter. But you should know this famous and mysterious stone circle or hedge or cromlech. Vocabulary is a lot easier, by the way, if you learn a few roots. So lith means stone. Mega, as I suspect you already know, means big. So a megalith is, yep, a very big stone. We will encounter lots more uh, post and lintel construction, uh, but since this is a particularly clear drawing and example, I wanted to label it and have you see it. Stonehenge is a famous example of architecture clearly designed for astronomical purposes. The stones are lined up with solstices. Archaeological astronomy is actually a fascinating and growing field. If you like both science and history, there's a career path. But alas, we can't linger there. It is time to move on to history.